This is the Earth Science Classroom. Welcome back to the channel. This video is all about the cryosphere. It is in the Earth System playlist, and we're looking at what the cryosphere is, the definition of this amazing sphere within the Earth's system as a component, a part of the big machine that makes the Earth work and function, and how it interacts and links with other spheres as well. So let's go and check it out. What is the cryosphere? So the cryosphere is defined as anything frozen on our planet, so frozen water. Now cryo comes from the Greek word meaning frost or frozen, and sphere comes from the Greek word meaning ball. But in modern day terms, we look at the sphere as a section realm part of the overall system of the Earth, which com combines and connects with other spheres like the hydrosphere with water that's not frozen, or the geosphere with the solid Earth, biosphere with the living organisms and species, and the atmosphere with the gaseous vapors around the Earth like oxygen, nitrogen, and argon. So the Earth has 70% water, parts of that is obviously frozen, or in water vapor, which is part of the atmosphere, and 30% land, which is the geosphere part of this system. So in terms of what the cryosphere includes in this sphere, we can look at as Earth scientists are any high elevations where the temperature drops down, where it can transform and cause a phase change to take liquid water into frozen water, which would be snow and ice and sleet, and uh, those mountain ranges that are certain altitude and elevation. Then you have glaciers or glaciers, then you have ice caps, then you have continental ice sheets, and parts of the uh, Arctic Ocean freeze over the winter months, less so than there was in, in previous uh, centuries, and also looking at the frozen ground component, which is going to be permafrost, which happens again in high latitudes in Northern Hemisphere, especially where the temperature drops and can freeze the soil subsurface. So when we're discussing the cryosphere, one of the big topics discussed and what is amazing about it is the continent of Antarctica, which was discovered apparently around 1820, and it was the last continent to be discovered by humans. And obviously there's no one living there permanently, uh, maybe in the past, maybe, but until it's been frozen like this with ice sheets and, gla and glaciers and glaciers for the last 15 million years, give or take a few million years, and has been separated from the other continents like Africa and India and Australia for the past 160 million years. So Antarctica is an amazing place to do research on ice, on paleoclimate conditions and proxy, pieces of evidence and isotopes of oxygen and nitrogen, other particles and particulates that can give ideas to scientists of how the Earth was in the past and various ice ages and interglacial and glacial periods, and which are warm periods and cold periods in the Earth's history. So no one really owns Antarctica, but it does have various research bases from various countries like New Zealand, Australia, Japan, America, England, Germany have various uh, scientists on there for a short time, but they generally leave during the winter months. So in terms of the ice, Antarctica has an, a thick ice cap of around, the average is about 2,100 meters thick, but the thickest parts are around 4,700 meters thick and contains 90% of the ice on our planet, which also holds or contains about 70% of our fresh water on this planet. So with the majority of the water and the fresh water being trapped or contained in the ice around Antarctica and on Antarctica, you can also look at glaciers or glaciers, which are frozen rivers, which are usually the exteriors of the ice caps, and you can have them retreat and extend based on the climate. So you can have permafrost in northern latitudes, like this beautiful tundra and boreal forest landscape. So in addition to the growth and expansion of ice sheets and glaciers or glaciers, or even the contraction and retreat of these massive ice sheets based on climate conditions and temperature, we can also look at the mass wasting component, which in this case would be avalanches, and how they can move large amounts of snow and ice at one time. Also looking at the carving 
of glaciers or glaciers on the edge of the ice sheets where the ice is going to break apart and fracture and fall into the, the water, causing various tsunamis and large waves, but also create a lot of these icebergs that will float in the water based on the currents. So we look at the cryosphere, we look at the Arctic, the Arctic Circle, Greenland, and how the Arctic North Pole can freeze over the top part of the ocean have a thin layer of ice over the winter months. Now, and this is the Northern Hemisphere. So we can look at the three to four meter average thickness of ice around the Arctic and Arctic Ocean, and at certain parts and certain times, it can be as thick as 20 meters. So this is important because we can look at the extent of this ice and measure it and see the fluctuations with climate, with different temperatures over a certain period of time and looking at the ice ages and how ice can expand down through the northern hemisphere through the land masses like Asia, Europe and North America through Canada and, and Alaska and into the United States and see how these historical ice ages have changed over time and the extent of the ice and how much land it covers. To summarize the cryosphere is anything to do with frozen water so anything in north and south pole in the higher latitudes, glaciers, ice sheets, icebergs, carving, permafrost, ice, sleet and snow in the atmosphere, any kind of water that's frozen is due with the cryosphere and how it reacts with the other spheres is amazing.